I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Gaston Alphonse Brown, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Corporate Governance, and Public Private Partnerships of Antigua and Barbuda, and I invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Secretary General, distinguished delegates, Antigua and Barbuda congratulates His Excellency Dennis Francis of Trinidad and Tobago on his election as president of this 78th session of the General Assembly. We are very proud of the contribution that the countries of the CARICOM community are making to advance inter internationalism in this United Nations organization and other multilateral bodies. In this connection, we regard as a further acknowledgement of CARICOM's capacity the election of Guyana to the Security Council from 2024 to 2026. Of course, Guyana's further service on the Security Council follows two years of active participation by yet another CARICOM state, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the smallest nation in the world to serve on the Security Council. What these accomplishments demonstrate is that size or smallness is not an impediment to making significant contributions to international decision-making. Consequently, we expect that the Alliance of Small Island States, EOSIS, will be given a seat at the table in significant fora, including the G20 meetings, even as an observer. Mr. President, the world is failing developing countries. Those are not my words but I certainly adopt them. They are the words of the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, spoken less than a week ago. Developing states, against many odds, have remarkably lifted hundreds of millions from the depths of poverty. They have been active participants in the United Nations, fervently searching for and offering global solutions. Yet, despite these strides, they find themselves ensnared in a myriad of global crises which they had no hand in creating. We are caught in a vortex of skyrocketing prices, overwhelming debts, and the undeniable increasing frequency of climate disasters. The current global frameworks, shaped largely by the more affluent nations, remain largely unresponsive to these crises. A united front can compel the global community to sit up, to listen, and to act. The developing world must build that unity of purpose, not in confrontation, but in collaboration, not in division, but in cooperation. So today, I call on the nations which have been excluded from global decision-making and which have been left behind to bridge the separation of their geographical distance and to join to advance the collective interests. That is why, Mr. President, Antigua and Barbuda has embarked on strategies, building alliances with the willing to counter the threats we face from the impacts of climate change and the failure of the international financial institutions and their policymakers to respond to the urgent needs of our peoples. One of these initiatives which is currently taking place was initiated two years ago in the margins of COP26 in Glasgow by the Prime Minister of Tuvalu, Kozia Natano, and myself. Frustrated by the lip service being paid by the world's major emitters and the broken promises of every previous COP meeting, we decided that we would seek an advisory opinion from the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, ITLUS, and that was concerning the obligation of states to combat pollution linked to climate change and its ensuing marine repercussions, such as ocean temperatures, rising ocean temperatures, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. Joined by other small island states, we co-founded the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, COSIS. COSIS sought and received a favorable agreement by ITLUS to hear our pleadings, which began on September 11th in Hamburg and which will continue until September 25th. Why did we go to ITLUS? We went to ITLUS because 
It is the guardian of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It is a natural venue to seek legal clarity on the obligations of states to protect our marine environment. Small island, developing states, SIDS, are primarily maritime states. We depend on the ocean not just for sustenance, but as a crucial part of our heritage and our identity. The ocean is also a vital carbon sink. With increasing ocean and terrestrial temperatures reaching record highs this summer, literally burning the planet, and simultaneously causing unprecedented storms, flooding, and droughts, all nations must act now to safeguard the oceans as critical or as a critical component of the Earth's climate system. The countries of COSIS are not seeking to rewrite laws. We are seeking clarity on existing ones. SIDS cannot sit idly while other countries or while our countries sink beneath our feet or are crippled by a burden of debt as we are left abandoned by the international system to rebuild within our own limited means one disaster after another. However, taking the case to Idlus is not an initiative just for the survival of SIDS. It is a vital effort for the preservation and prosperity of all nations in our shade world. In this connection, Antigua and Barbuda and other member, members of COSIS will also stand with this General Assembly in its decision, initiated by Vanuatu, to seek and advise your opinion from the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states with respect to climate change. We consider this as a duty of care for the peoples of the world. Mr. President, another bold initiative we have championed revolves around the Multidimensional Vulnerability Index, the MVI, as set out by the General Assembly in 2021. Why the MVI? Because it is crucial. Since though not the poorest countries, are extremely vulnerable to climate and other shocks, and they lack resilience due to structural problems of limited human and financial resources, lack of economies of scale, and higher costs due to their isolation from major manufacturing hubs. Therefore, the sole criterion of per capita income denying us access to concessional financing is unfair and unjust. The MVI is not just a tool. It is our gateway to essential financing, to robust national planning, to debt servicing, and possibly our final beacon when seeking insurance and compensation against the rising tides. Mr. President, we intend to continue to advance these contentions in the international financial institutions. Particularly, we will raise this urgent issue at the joint meeting of the IMF and World Bank in Marrakesh next month. We call on all SIDS and all fair-minded countries to join us in advancing the MVI as a vital component in facilitating access to concessional financing. Mr. President, Antigua and Barbuda greatly look forward to hosting the fourth international conference on small island developing states from May 27th to 30th, 2024, under the theme, Charting the Course Towards Resilient Prosperity. I've highlighted the stark realities faced by SIDS. We are grappling with the impacts of global phenomena, from the lingering effects of COVID to climate change, and the international economic and financial repercussions of Russia's incursion into Ukraine. Additionally, we are burdened with staggering debts, unfavorable trade terms, and a global financial architecture that fails to meet our needs. Our upcoming conference is therefore more than just a forum. We must aim to develop a bold, decade-long strategy that will illuminate the path forward, addressing our unique and interconnected challenges to ensure a resilient and prosperous future for our citizens. Given these challenges, and in collaboration with the private sector and UN entities, Antigua and Barbuda will establish a center of excellence for SIDS that will enable all SIDS to achieve sustainable, resilient prosperity. The truth is unavoidable. 
Many major greenhouse gas emitting countries have not met their commitments. The previously set boundary, a temperature rise of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, will be breached on the current trajectory. The risks we face are not just on the horizon. They are here and they are now, requiring an urgent commitment to reduce emissions. Small island states' capacity to adjust and to build resilience cannot keep pace with the fast occurrence of extreme climate events. And I emphasize that we will suffer first, but what we will endure is only the precursor of the fate of every nation. We are all running out of time, and we need to act now to save our planet. Mr. President, the summit meeting of the Conference of the Parties, the COP in Dubai, will be crucial for the future of our planet. Not only does COP28 comes at a time where the world is witnessing climate chaos, but this summit is particularly important because it will include a global stock take. Countries will assess how far they have come on cutting planet heat and pollution. However, the awful truth is already clear. Eight years after the climate agreement in Paris, global progress has been far from sufficient. The world is currently not in line with the temperature targets outlined in the Paris Agreement. According to the European Union's Climate Change Service, this year's June to August period was not only the warmest since 1940, but it also saw temperatures soaring towards 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. A red line once deemed sacrosanct will be crossed if urgent action is not taken. Warnings have turned to imminent danger. Therefore, what was already a crucial matter for action at COP28 has now become an imperative for action. And that is the loss and damage fund for which small island states have been praying, pleading, and literally begging. Not that we should be begging. Now we must recall that all that happened at COP27 last year is that the world's great polluters agreed only at last minute that such a fund was important. But agreement was not establishment. What we got was the formation of a transitional committee to make recommendations for consideration at COP28. And certainly that was not sufficient. The issue was once again deferred. Now, we must insist at COP28 that the loss and damage fund must be made operational and adequately funded. So it must provide adequate financing to help SIDS withstand the inevitable ruin that the actions of the major polluters are continuing to wreak. If COP28 fails in this critical mission, it risks undermining global trust, potentially sabotaging cooperative efforts on myriad global challenges. It is my ardent hope that when we gather in Dubai, the shared spirit of responsibility will prevail such that the dying embers of hope can be reignited by the flame of action. Mr. President, Antigua and Barbuda unequivocally asserts that climate justice and reparatory justice are deeply intertwined. They are inseparable. It is essential for this esteemed assembly to understand that Climate justice is not a standalone concern. As I said before, the issues are inseparable. Historically, the nations that thrived on the Industrial Revolution did so on the backs of enslaved and victimized generations from the Caribbean and other corners of the African diaspora. It is unjust that countries that paid the highest human price are now bearing the heaviest climate burden. I say to this August body that that is unjust and must be addressed with urgency. A recent UN report aptly underscores that while legal routes to compensation may be complex, 
it by no means nullifies the moral and ethical obligations stemming from these historical wrongs. These historical wrongs must be addressed, and we urge the nations complicit in the dark legacy of enslavement to recognize, to reconcile, and to redress soonest. Our shared future must be built on justice, understanding, and cooperation. Mr. President, another pivotal theme of this General Assembly resonates deeply with us. That is, rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity, which now stands on shaky ground. It is worth emphasizing that no nation, large or small, can truly flourish amid such global turbulence particularly for smaller states like mine, which rely heavily on the consistent hum of global stability for essential sectors like tourism, the stakes are incredibly high. Our plea is simple. We beseech the world's formidable nations to engage in dialogue and embrace mutual respect. These are not just pathways to global peace, but also the avenues that ensure the prosperity of every citizen. Join on this theme of trust, I urge the United States to revisit its stance on Cuba. It is high time for the U.S. to remove Cuba from its list of state sponsors of terrorism. You know it's not true. And to bring an end to the outdated embargo that harms the human populace. Your policy against Cuba is cruel and wicked and ought to be addressed with urgency. Similarly, we advocate for the removal of sanctions in Venezuela, especially those that hinder the Venezuelan government's access to U.S. financial system and literally block oil imports from the state-owned PDVSA. It cannot be ignored that these sanctions amplify the human crisis in Venezuela contributing to the very large number of refugees into neighboring countries. So the United States ought to take responsibility for the amount of refugees and not blame the administration in Venezuela. The sanctions also harm innocent Caribbean countries that hitherto benefited from the petro caribbean Initiative, which served as an energy stabilization mechanism for these countries. We are hurting too. And that is why we argue in this August forum that the sanctions should be lifted. As members of this United Nations organization, we are all bound by its charter that enshrines dialogue and peaceful conflict resolution. Today, I fervently urge every nation to recommit to these cornerstone principles, ensuring that they are respected, that they are followed, and to be followed as the bedrock of all international relations. Mr. President, I now turn to the crisis in Haiti. The enduring challenges faced by Haiti remain at the forefront of international consciousness. Historically, the scars of Haiti's struggle for freedom from enslavement are juxtaposed with the exploitative economic interests of France in the 18th and 19th centuries and have left deep in prints. The burden of compensation to France for over a century, essentially buying their liberty, has curtailed the developmental prospects of the Haitian people for generations. Sub subsequent interventions compounded these problems. Internationally, or internally, episodes of autocratic leadership have further eroded the national fabric. The recent mission by the CARICOM Eminent Persons Group, seeking a resolution to Haiti's political deadlock, voiced deep concerns over the rising dominance of gangs and the ensuing human rights crisis. The immediate imperative, or imperatives are clear. An urgent, comprehensive, coordinated intervention is required that will concurrently restore governance, security, and the rule of law while resolving the humanitarian crisis. The CARICOM eminent persons strongly recommended that a broad-based trans transitional government is the linchpin for effective governance. It is our aspiration that this proposed representative 
transitional government materializes to provide the necessary leadership that is required with external assistance to restore order and bring lasting peace and prosperity to the suffering people of Haiti. Antigua and Barbuda stands resolutely in solidarity with the Haitian people. In this regard, I reaffirm my government's pledge to cooperate with all Haitian stakeholders and with the international community in the efforts to reinstate the rule of law, restoring democracy, and assisting with the security and human or humanitarian relief. The people of Haiti deserve no less. Mr. President, I now turn to the use of illegal guns. The use of illegal guns accounts for a significant percentage of all recorded homicides in the Caribbean. At an average of 15.1 per 100,000, the region has one of the highest homicides in the world, three times the world's average. Yet, Mr. President, no country in the Caribbean manufactures a single weapon or a single round of ammunition. Not one. The majority of these weapons originate in the United States, from which they are smuggled or trafficked to bolster organized criminals involved in trafficking illicit narcotics. In an event, the fallout from these illegal guns is their increasing use in Caribbean countries and the clear threat that they pose to our societies and the capacity of our law enforcement to cope. Given that all our countries are bordered by vast expanses of sea, we face further challenges to obtain modern technology, including satellite imagery, radar, and surveillance systems to try to stop the smuggling of weapons. But, Mr. President, while our region is confronting the threats to our security arising from illegal traditional weapons, we're even more alarmed at the potential for autonomous weapons to fall into the hands of organized criminals. Consider drone, meticulously programmed with facial recognition technology, set to target an individual. It scans, identifies, and eliminates its target, all while operating undetected. Mr. President, this isn't the plot of a dystopian novel, but a looming reality. Just a month ago, under the theme of a new agenda for peace, the UN Secretary General sounded the alarm bell. He has urged nations to formulate a legally binding instrument by 2026 to prohibit lethal autonomous weapon systems. Antigua and Barbuda fully supports this recommendation and we will work with other nations to successfully conclude an international treaty that shields our societies and safeguards our nations to ensure our national security from this threat. Mr. President, Antigua and Barbuda is small in size, without military might and financial influence, but our spirit stands tall. We refuse to let our size diminish our voice or lessen our rightful place at the decision-making table. Since our first steps as a sovereign state in 1981, we have championed a world where equity, fairness, and social justice are not mere buzzwords, but lived realities. And yet, with a heavy heart, we note the ever-widening chasm between the affluent and the struggling, between those who hold the reins of power and those who yearn for their rightful share. Year after year, leaders like myself stand at this podium. We speak of financial justice, of climate justice, but our cries, it seems, echo in a vast void. Words abound, but transformative action remains elusive. I often sense the skepticism from my fellow citizens when they ask, why speak when it feels like the world isn't truly listening? But Mr. President, I remember this. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it was the tiniest of microbes, unseen, unanticipated, that brought nations, great and small, to their knees. It wasn't the, or let's say, an arsenal of weapons or a mountain of wealth that provided a beacon in those dark times. It was global cooperation. Let us not forget, 
it was collective global action. The same truth applies beyond pandemics. Whether we aim for worlds steeped in peace, basking in prosperity, or forward-looking in progress, our only hope lies in banding together. We are all part of a human civilization. We are all fundamentally one and the same people, and we must band together. Every nation, regardless of its power or wealth, shares this interwoven destiny. Therefore, let us never relent in our pursuit of change. For the sake of humanity, for our shared planet, let us shape a world that is not only better, but also just, prosperous, and inclusive for all. Antiguan Barbuda stands ready, as ever, to play its part. We call in the powerful and the rich to do the same. I thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I thank, on behalf of the Assembly, the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Corporate Governance, and Public-Private Partnership of Antigua and Barbuda for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Raymond Donc Sima, Prime Minister of the Gabonese Republic, a request protocol to escort His Excellency. <laughs> 